Thanks a lot, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. It's my great honor to be here today, and I thank the organizers for the invitation that they extended to me. My talk today is on the sustainability of automobile fuels. Basically, the world, it seems, has a problem. And I, uh, the focus of this presentation is going to be on resource limitations. And it's not that technical, really. It's really been prepared for the public presentation. And it's something that can benefit policymakers, politicians, and even anybody who wants to understand where our world is heading. Now, the basic problem statement is that 95% of the world's transportation sector depends on petroleum oil. This includes aviation, shipping. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for petroleum. We wouldn't be able to get food and medicines around the world if it isn't for transportation. But the world, from its best estimate, has only 1.3 trillion barrels of proven oil reserves being consumed at 85 million barrels a day. And it doesn't take a fifth grader to calculate that this will run out in only 42 years. But if you assume 2% growth per year, which is you know reasonable, some countries are growing at 6%, some at 1%, and some at a negative rate, overall, then the oil will last 31 years. In these calculations, I don't really want very accurate numbers. Plus minus 100 or 200 billion barrels still leaves me in the same perspective. Uh, if you observe, 1 billion barrels of oil last 12 days. 100 billion will last a little over three years. And if uh, instead of 31 years, the oil lasts 34 years, there's no big deal. Now, some say that improved efficiency, gas efficiency gasoline engines can help save, sort of mitigate the problem. But you know, they are only a band-aid solution. All right, you can increase fuel efficiency by 10%, 20%, but then instead of lasting 31 years, you'll just get 34 years. You're trying to squeeze the last drops out of the lemon. And then they say that new oil field discoveries are taking place every year, but you know how large these oil fields are off the coast of Brazil, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the Gulf of Mexico. They are 2 billion barrels, 3 billion barrels, 5 billion barrels. Of course, it's touted as, oh, wow, it's a great discovery, big oil, big oil. Of course, it's big oil for those who found it. At $100 a barrel for a 3 billion barrel oil field, it's $300 billion in revenue. They want to make their money for sure. But for the world, how long will three billion <laughs> barrels last? So it's imperative that an alternative fuel needs to be found for transportation in order to avoid a crisis. So my premise comes from the perspective of being a construction engineer, something very down to earth. I can only plan and construct tomorrow the technology I have today. I can't depend on research that is unsure, that's still taking place. How would you react if you went to the bad stomachache to the doctor and the doctor said, wait a second, I mean, can you wait a year, I mean, I'm researching this fantastic medicine. I'm not sure if it'll be, if it'll really work or not, but uh, you, you want something now. It takes, for, for planning new industries, it takes about 20, 25 years. You can't spawn a new industry um, within just a year or two. I mean, you can grow a crop of corn in a year, but you just see how many years it's taken the automobile industry to evolve. Dozens of years. And there's a famous Arabic proverb which says, it's better to fix the known than Wait for the unknown. Act now with what you can, rather than risking something much greater later on. Well, coming to automobiles. Many of you know the picture. You're familiar with it. Manila, Delhi, Beijing. Incidentally, this, traf this caused a traffic jam, the largest traffic jam in the world that lasted five days. Is this what we expected from our civilization? 
and it's Hanoi, Seoul, Tehran. And it goes on even to first world countries. Paris, Moscow, and even what they call the capital of the world, Washington, D.C. Allow me to say that some people love their automobile and their car and their traffic. Uh, Ms. Rosanna from, USA, uh, from UNESCO was telling me before the, my presentation that she misses, and she's from Canada, that she misses the traffic in Canada. She misses the car and the freedom. She lives in Venice these days. And, you know, we really, and incidentally, the previous presentation pointed out that Canada is one of the happiest countries in the world. So, well, the bottom line is that we love our car. Um, the, we, in 2008, we had 800 million automobiles. In 2012, this year, we've got a billion. We are growing at 50 million a year. And that's more than the number of people we are adding. And now we are at one car for every seven people. Well, so what do we do about all this? First of all, we must distinguish between concept cars and feasible cars. Concept cars are those that are really closer to science fiction than reality. You are wind powered, nuclear powered, solar powered, algae fuel. They are just not in the implementation stage. They cannot get into mass production. They are not feasible. Feasible cars include those that run on natural gas, hydrogen fuel cells, biofuels, hybrid, hybrid vehicles, electric hybrids, and other electric vehicles. I should also point out here that another feasible technology is synthetic uh, fuel from synthetic coal. And while the, that synthetic fuel is 30% more efficient than the normal gasoline engine, the world is in no mood to implement uh, the synthetic fuel from coal. The reason that synthetic fuel from coal emits twice the amount of carbon dioxide that your gasoline engine emits. We are already at 380 parts per million of carbon dioxide on this earth, increasing at about two parts per million every year. Scientists tell me that once we reach 400 parts per million, human life is going to be threatened. So we cannot really, in our sanity, consider synthetic fuel from coal. Even though it's an old technology, it was first introduced in Germany in 1920s, in the 1920s, and it was in fact used uh, by the Germans during the Second World War, it works. Another type of fuel is synthetic fuel from biofuels that I understand is actually also more in the laboratory research stages, and Professor Roman Gerala yesterday confirmed to me that yes, it is really uh, there's a long distance uh, uh, to its feasibility. So let's look at natural gas. If that's a feasible technology, how far can we get with it? What can we do with it? And what can we make from it? Well, first of all, propane engines are pretty good. They last twice as long as your conventional gasoline engine. Um, let's come down to this one. They emit uh, fewer, one third fewer organic, uh, sorry, uh, reactive organic gases. That's really good for the environment. Their performance is similar to a gasoline powered car. That's also real good. I mean, instead of accelerating to 60 miles per hour in five seconds, if I accelerate in seven seconds, no big deal. And the range is also about 25% less. I'm not worried about that also. Instead of being able to travel 250 miles on a gas tank, if I can travel 200 miles, that's also pretty good. But how long can we last with natural gas? How much natural gas do we have in the world? We have 5,210 trillion cubic feet in the world, uh, uh, except USA, and in USA we have 2,074 trillion cubic feet. Again, give or take a few hundred trillion cubic feet, no big deal. These are the best estimates, and my estimates are in this presentation are always on the more conservative side. So going with 2008 data, but of course when I apply the growth factor, it doesn't matter, it all gets absorbed. With 806 million cars, 
natural gas used for cars <clears throat> at the gasoline gallon equivalent of gasoline to compress natural gas. You'll need 59.3 trillion cubic feet. You still, you still keep, you, they are still burning natural gas for electricity and other purposes at an estimated growth rate of 3%. You'll last 40 years. And USA, same picture. If you, the USA went down that road, it'll last 41. Now, what about oil shale? All these novel technologies, these unconventional technologies, Arctic oil, pre-salt deep water off the coast of Brazil, oil sands, tight oil, great, very good. Well, for all these things, the total reserves for tight oil, for instance, are 300 billion barrels, but these reserves include proven reserves which have a 90% recovery, recovery factor, uh, probable, probable reserves that have a 50% recovery factor, and unproven reserves, which are really a laugh, that have 10% recovery factor. When you <coughs> multiply the total uh, reserves, uh, well, proven and probable reserves by their probability factor, you get a total of 703.5 billion barrels of all these unconventional fuels that, of course, the world says, you know, is uh, a great find. You know, we are going to save the world. Uh, uh, but only for 19 to 23 years, depending on how much growth you consider. So we move on to the next one, hydrogen fuel. You see, get the drift now. We are going to keep adding up the numbers. We are going to see how long we can survive. All right? There are two types of hydrogen cars. The first, the, the first is the hydrogen internal combustion engine vehicle, but that in its nitrous oxides, obviously we can't go in that direction. What the people are really talking about is the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. It's an electrochemical cell that produces electricity from hydrogen with water as a byproduct. And of course, we all think that water is a harmless thing, right? All right, well, let's see. The benefits of hydrogen are that it's a zero emission vehicle, great way to go, very efficient use of onboard hydrogen, uses a renewable fuel source, which is where we really want to go. A, we want to save our environment, but I'm not emphasizing, I mean, my talk is not built about the environment, it's built about resource limitations. Uh, and two, um, we want, uh, yeah, okay, so, so we want to save the environment, and two, we want to overcome the crisis that's about to come in front of us. But there are concerns. If water is a byproduct, Incidentally, 95% of the greenhouse gases are water vapor. If we keep putting up water vapor into the environment and the air get, and the heat gets trapped more and more, think about what a sauna is like. And do we really want to go there by heating up our atmosphere more and more? Well. If that's not enough, there are four other concerns with hydrogen. One, that the, at the current production uh, uh, capabilities, a hydrogen fuel cell car costs $300,000. They say, all right, with the economies of scale, et cetera, they can probably bring it down to 50,000. All right. It takes 25 years to 30 years to get there. There's no sign that the world is heading towards that. You have to build up an uh, infrastructure for gas, uh, gasoline refilling and all that. It's not much, relatively speaking, just $500 billion, manageable over 40, 50 years, at 10, 12 and a half billion dollars, no big deal. That's just for the USA. But here's the rub. Platinum cells, which are used as catalysts uh, in, the, um, uh, in the batteries, uh, in the cells, um, they malfunction below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So your entire northern Europe, Russia, northern China, northern America, all the big users of automobiles do not have an all-weather vehicle throughout the year. Only the warm climate can really benefit. And then another problem is that hydrogen is sometimes, is, well, needs to be stored in high-pressure tanks because though it has three times the energy of gasoline, it occupies four times the volume. Four times the volume means that a 12, uh, 15 ga uh, gallon gas tank needs to be 60 gallons. 
But if you construct a gas tank with 60 gallon size, it'll make the automobile very heavy. And all the axles and in chassis and in stuff needs to become heavier. So it's stored at high pressure. But ladies and gentlemen, the high pressure security and storage problems are still not foolproof. So Dr. Stephen Chu, a Nobel Prize laureate, said, uh, he's the Secretary of Energy in President Obama's cabinet, said that we need four miracles for hydrogen fuel cells to become a reality. Those same four things that I spoke about. Can anybody guess why four miracles? Because it takes three miracles to be ordained a saint. And if uh, Professor Grossman, after being enlightened by the Dalai Lama yesterday, were to become a priest from a scientist, which would be a miracle in itself, and then he was to perform three miracles against the laws of physics, of which he's a master, then he would be ordained a saint. And then, if, if that's not enough, if that's not enough, if that's not enough, you still have to face the issue of platinum resources in the world, provided you can overcome those miracles. Well, there are one billion ounces of platinum in the world. You're producing 50 million cars per year. The entire platinum on our beautiful planet is going to be depleted in eight years. All right, so you want to recycle and all that sort of stuff. All right, try enforcing some policies. Try managing the theft of platinum. Then there's no growth potential. What about gener future generations? When you have children, and you have four children to a family. What do you do? Biofuels. The <clears throat> two types, ethanol, where you get energy from burning of alcohol and sugars, or biodiesel derived from vegetable oils and animal fats. Very, we use very little of biofuels in the world. Perhaps there's a reason for it. Up till now in the USA, they use just 0.21%. We really want to use E100, which is all ethanol in our engine, because when oil runs out, hey, we need, we can't depend on oil. E10 means 90% ethanol. Well, in a, a E100 vehicle, your emissions are reduced 10 to 30 percent, and even though ethanol engines are only 67 percent as efficient as gasoline engines, which are really very inefficient machines, I could still live with it, but you've got to grow your ethanol. And taking the example of USA, which has only 396 million acres of arable land, and consuming 146 billion gallons of gasoline for its 250 million vehicles, you need, for a gasoline gallon equivalent of 1.5 gallons of corn ethanol to one gallon of gasoline, you need 219 billion gallons of corn. That requires 590 million acres. We just don't have enough land in the United States and by extrapolation in the rest of the world. But sugar is little better. It has seven times the energy content of corn, and you can grow all the uh, mm, fuel uh, from sugar in the whole world using 23% of the total land. But uh, sugar from uh, ethanol from sugarcane grows only in warm climates. Yes, you can produce um, uh, biofuels from beet sugar, but it's four times less efficient and four times costly. So you need warm climates. So what does this mean? That your fuel dependence could shift from oil producing countries to sugar producing countries in tropical regions. And that's going to obviously entail a major shift in world power. You're going to have a different world order and I don't know how easily countries and powerful nations are going to relinquish their power. This is where the oil is produced in the world. All right? And this is where the cane sugar is produced. You see, there's no similarity. 
your world can turn upside down and literally speaking, shift from north to south. The red is the cane sugar. So well, let's look at biodiesel because we really want to look at all these different sources of fuel. Yeah, you reduce greenhouse gas emissions, hell of a lot. The, of course, I should say that the major sources of biodiesel are palm and soy oil that the world is really talking about these days. If it's good enough to eat, you can probably live with its emissions. Uh, it lowers carcinogenic properties, and um, biodiesel is really good. It yields 320% more energy uh, than is required for production. It's 13 times better than corn ethanol. Great way to go. But coming back to our old arithmetic, we need to grow it. There's only so much land. And if you were to go on the basis that you could use all the, well, if you could use all the arable land in USA, overcoming the climate restraints, you'll still need 500% more land than you have to grow soy, soy oil, than, than you have just to grow soy oil. And 71% if you want to grow palm oil. Now, do you want to eat or do you want to travel? The world is in a crisis. And then they talk about algae research, a promise, of course, I've heard promises before, that it can grow on 1.1% of land area. If it works out, it's great. Oh, you'll be able to save the world. But when it does, I don't know when it's going to happen. I can't depend on it. I want to plan today for tomorrow. I can't plan on things that are in research. So let's look at hybrid electric vehicles. And there's a strong hybrid, like the Toyota Prius, that can run on gasoline or on electric batteries or both. Or there's the uh, power assist hybrid that uses this electric power to boost performance if you want to overtake somebody or climb up a hill, for instance, like the Honda Insight. But you still rely on gasoline as the source of fuel. Or if not gasoline, on the hydrogen fuel cell. Or if not the hydrogen fuel cell, sugar ethanol, or corn ethanol, or palm, or soy. And somebody made an estimate that even if every vehicle in the United States was a hybrid, then because of growth in demand and population, by 2025, we would still be consuming the same amount of gasoline as we are using now. So all that will do is give you a little bit extra lease on life, and your hybrid cars would last 40 years instead of about 30 years. All right? But now, that is only part of the problem. The Toyota Prius needs lanthanum for its nickel metal hydride battery. Lanthanum is a rare earth mineral. 95 to 97% of all the rare earths in the world are being manufactured in China. That has threatened to not, uh, that has threatened to, that has been raising the prices of rare earth minerals over the last few years, about 10, and threatens to stop all exports by 2013, maybe 2050. The European Union, USA, and Japan took China to the, filed a lawsuit uh, against China at the World Trade Organization in March of this year, and we wonder what the outcome will be. Even if the WTO rules against China, will China continue to export? It's an open uh, but debatable question. It creates some uncertainty. You see, disputes and wars are a fundamental characteristic of the human being. War is always easy to wage. It's a downhill task. It's the peace that you have to fight for. The peace that is an uphill task. Well, if we can overcome these geostrategic constraints, all right, if somebody can twist China's arm, I don't know who will be ready to face up to that challenge. You have only 13.2 billion pounds of lanthanum in the world. You need 27 pounds per Prius on average. It'll last for 489 million cars. At 50 million cars per year, it's going to last 10 years. 
So you can avoid the use of all these nickel metal hydride batteries by using an AC motor and a lithium ion battery. Well, we've come a long way from the lead acid battery to the nickel metal hydride battery, and now we are going to lithium ion battery that's half the weight of the nickel metal hydride in, uh, in, in twice the capacity. Because that's attractive, isn't it? Now, maybe we have a solution there. All right, gentlemen, how much lithium is there in the ground? Same old process of analysis. Nothing difficult, nothing different. You have 28.4 million tons that make so much lithium carbonate that lasts 43 years at our current rate of production, 43 years. So now, we might want to mine our oceans that have a lot of everything, but of course oceans have a lot of everything. They even have a lot of uranium and iron and so on. So what? Now we want to mess with the ocean? We aren't satisfied after having messed with the atmosphere? We emit only six billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It represents only 0.02% of the greenhouse gases. And with that much, we are threatening our environment. So what, do you think we are ready to start mining our oceans, even just about 0.5%, which is 50 times more than the 0.02%, or I think maybe 250 times. If you want to mess with it, yeah, you can last a long time. You can last about 1,800 years. You might want to experiment with it for a few hundred years. Are you up to the experimentation? Do you want to take a risk with your planet? Once we destroy the ocean, we destroy life on Earth. We are already going to destroy the atmosphere in a few years. We are going to go beyond 400 parts per million. And I don't think we are content. So there is then what's left. The extended range vehicle and the plug-in hybrid vehicle. All right? The plug-in hybrid is essentially an electric vehicle with a gas tank backup or a hydrogen fuel cell backup or a corn ethanol backup. The extended range electrical vehicle uses an internal combustion engine. It runs on the battery, okay, it runs on the battery, but uses the internal combustion engine to charge the batteries once the batteries get depleted. So again, you need either some gasoline engine or you need an ethanol engine or a biofuel engine or something or the other. But, ladies and gentlemen, you have the same electric ethanol um, and fuel cell restraints, as already discussed previously. Where are we going to go? With sugar ethanol, we um, have to change the world order. Well, somebody said, let's use a mix of all these technologies, you know, so as to not have to suddenly jumpstart an economy and an, an industry or an uh, industrial system and therefore avoid the trauma, trauma for technology changeover. You know, it will all reduce the strain on the resources. But hey, you can't beat the system. We can't create the miracle of producing more platinum on the earth. Somebody says, oh, nanotechnology will come to the re rescue. When? How much time, you know? We don't know. It's still in the research phases. I can't take a political, industrial, or construction decision on things that are in the research phase. So biodiesel, well, sugar can work. It's quite doable, really. It's quite doable. 23 percent isn't much. In the United States, the, the United States government gives uh, subsidies to farmers to not grow anything on about 15 percent of the land. Okay? So, well, you know, 23 percent is just a stretch. It's doable, but it can't, the change can't come easily. It has to come at quite a cost. Well, here's a summary of everything. The IC engine with oil lasts 31 years, natural gas, gas 50, the unconventional technologies 19, platinum 8, lithium 43, 
length number 12, all together you have 161 years. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a conservative number from my estimates. And you know, when you go, when you start drilling, when you go deeper and deeper, when you approach the end, the energy required to extract from a deeper level increases by leaps and bounds. It becomes very expensive. And then the ability to get through the petroleum fields and extract the oil in a clean manner also starts posing problems. So 31 years is kind of optimistic. But you can grow some, you can grow biofuels. The best option is by sugar ethanol, 23% of land area, but it requires a warm climate. There are promises and hopes that lithium sulfur batteries can increase range by five times, lithium air by 10 times, will make your lithium last 400 years instead of 40. <clears throat> that algae can, have you already discussed algae? That you can use one-tenth the amount of platinum compared to what you are using. These are things that people are researching. MIT researchers are researching it, no doubt. But I know about research. Uh, some is very good, and a lot doesn't get implemented, doesn't see the light of day. And then there are rumors. Number one, that there really is no oil shortage. Well, you can beat your brains against the best geological scientists or listen to the propaganda of the United States Geological Survey, which, you know, in fact reversed its propaganda about 15 years ago. It tried to say that there's lots of oil in the world, don't worry. Of course, they want to placate the public because they don't want anybody to panic, but even they have come around. And I don't want you folks to panic either. And the next rumor is that the innovative power of humans will find a solution. Right, what sense of entitlement do we have? What have we done for Mother Earth that she should reward us? What have we done for the Lord God that he should continue to shower gifts on us? And those who say that there is no God, that everything is within the control of the human being, and that the human being has all these choices and options to make his destiny, sounds like a very self-centered argument. So, world dependence on oil is essentially a security and economical risk. It threatens our way of life. And essentially, the system is not sustainable. Now, I hope something does happen. Yes, of course, I do. I wish a breakthrough could come, but I don't know of one today. It seems a completely new world order will be necessary, which will be nothing like we are used to. Changes are possible, but strong political will is necessary, something that's missing in our politicians. And if it does come, it may come at an immense cost. And the type of cost that I can see, that I think, is represented by these people who you know well. When you can't get food to their destination, when you can't get medicine to your destination. So, in my epilogue, like after the world ends, <laughs> you know, you can go to market in a horse-driven car, car. You can take a bride home in a horse car. Pretty good. It really is a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And you can really have all the excitement in the world with all your races. And you can bet and gamble just like you're doing now. Okay? Or you can take your industrial goods like cement bags to market in a bullock cart. Or take children to school and have them smiling at that too. How many children smile these days while going to school? <laughs> and tell me any car that can do that that can ford a river. You can only do it with a bullock cart. And again, you can have all the excitement and races that you like. Remember that the bull with the turban always comes out ahead. So, there are lots of benefits of these horse-drawn carriages and bullock carts. It's very cheap. Everybody knows how they are manufactured. Emissions are nothing to worry about. You have benefits. Recycling not necessary, spare parts not needed. You need a few more wets, so have a great useful life. 12 to 18 years, probably more than a car. Health effects, you return to an easy pace of life. Like what? Like what you always wanted. But wait a second. If each car is considered equivalent to a pair of horses or pair of bulls. And if you just look at the US example, where you have 250 million cars, you'll need, two, and vehicles, you'll need 250 million bull, uh, yeah, bulls and horses. Now, you know, some vehicles have, have, might have 12 horses, like your trailer trucks, or long trailer trucks, and you know, some may have just a single horse, but, if you, uh, you know, make some assumptions and approximations and consider a pair of bulls, you still need one acre of grazing land per pair of cattle or pair of horses. That brings us to 250 million acres required, 63% of arable land, and, you know, tell me, let's argue whether that's feasible. Are you going to be able to sustain that sort <laughs> of a system? So maybe we'll develop walking skills. Some of our researchers will develop lighter titanium, you know, walking sticks. We'll probably learn to walk better, more upright and all that, you know. We'll be able to walk longer. Our range will increase. And we'll be less tired. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps our future is like our past. We'll become one with nature. Pretty good, I think. That's pretty nice. We'll re re rediscover our innocence. I don't mind that. Or maybe we'll learn to walk like this. I'd really like to walk like this. Maybe many of you would. And if you did, why would you need any other form of transportation? But most important of all, I think we really need to learn how to walk with God, the Creator. If we really can go in that direction, that's going to get us home. So in the end, actually, we see that some new paradigms altogether are needed. We cannot find solution right now, but we must become prepared for finding new solutions. And we need these new paradigms that are not at the forefront of world thinking. Our politicians are not talking about that. Our industrialists are not implementing them in the large, large scale that we need across the world. So, of course, an underlying theme of this conference like even the Dalai Lama mentioned that, you know, there's nothing left except hope and prayer. I said, my God, it seems that's the underlying theme of the out-of-the-box conference, and that's really all that we have left. We hope that things can work out. Thanks a lot, ladies.